What's going on, Restoration Nation? Rico Garcia here. I'm bringing yet another amazing episode. Today, we are joined by Nick Brandon, which is the founder and CEO of Hero Roofing. He started the company back in 2018. He's already generated over $12 million in revenue and counting. And on this episode, he's going to be sharing his entire journey, how he got into the business, how his first hires went, scaling that business, the importance of marketing and community, um, and a lot of other exciting uh, you know, information and insights that he has from his journey uh, from just getting started in the roofing business to a very, very successful business that he's continuously looking to expand. So I think that this is gonna be a really fun episode for you. But before we jump in, first and foremost, I wanna go ahead and give a big shout out to our show sponsors, starting with CNR Magazine. Again, if you don't have your subscription yet, stop, just go to cnrmagazine.com, hit the big subscribe button, and get your subscription today. Also wanna to give a big shout out to Restoration Referral System. Uh, if you go on to restorationreferralsystem.com forward slash dominate, we got a pretty special offer for you there. If you're looking to tap into uh, generating some more referrals and leads from insurance agents, it's a really, really uh, awesome program. Also, big shout out to Company Cam, but as per usual, we will go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into Company Cam in the middle of the episode. Meanwhile, let's dive right in. Let's go. Owning any type of restoration business is demanding. Demanding of your time, your energy, and resources. And that's why we're here. This is Restoration Domination. If you're a contractor in water mitigation, mold remediation, biohazard cleanup, roofers, or public adjusters, you'll learn how to dominate using some of the techniques and strategies that our guests will share. We'll interview top industry insiders, movers and shakers, hustlers and hackers, and anyone dominating their industry. This is Restoration Domination. Hustle, hack, and dominate. And here's your host, Rico Garcia. All right, guys, what is going on? Nick, man, thank you so much for uh, jumping on today. Are you ready to help us dominate? Oh, yes, sir. Let's go. Let's do it. All right, so do me a favor, man. Let's fill in some of the gaps on the intro for those watching and listening that aren't familiar with the name, aren't familiar with your company. Just kind of fill in some of the gaps there. Yeah, so, of course, like you said, I'm, my name is Nick Brannon. Uh, me and my father own and operate Hero Roofing. We are in Noonan, Georgia, which is South Metro Atlanta. We opened in uh, business in 2018. Prior to that, I was bartending and valet and cars and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I say roofing found me and I fell in love with it and it's changed, changed my life. And I like talking about it and seeing if I can help other people. But yeah, we came in business 2018. Uh, we've grown rapidly. Uh, we've now hit just over $12 million in sales since day one. So this last year, 2021, we closed at $7 million for our company. And we have a goal next year or this year now, 2022, to do 12 million the, the full year. Right. So talk to us about that journey, right? Because obviously, I mean, you know, getting to any kind of business and you see there, there's all kinds of players, right? There's the guys that are making tons of money in whatever arena. And then the guys that are just kind of like, yeah, you know, they've been in the roofing game for like 10 years, but they still aren't hitting $2 million a year. Right. Revenue, right. So like, what, what was that initial journey like, right? To get to the first mill, two mill, like what, what did you have to do or who did you learn from to say, okay, cool. This is the stuff that I need to be doing in my business, or this is the stuff that I need to start staying away from in my business. So walk us through that process yeah well i will first say you know what they say uh you know winners focus on winning right but i will say i, I like to look at like some industry leaders in, in our community not just our market but in the roofing community so a lot of the, a lot of the bigger guys i would keep up with and see what they're doing like apple roofing and monarch roofing and see how they would market and brand but starting out day one you know no one really knew who our company was so i generated business of course you know door to door I was knocking doors all day long. My dad would actually drive. He'd drive him to the house. I'd jump out, knock on the door, get in the truck. We'd drive to the next house. We would do that until, you know, we were established in business. A lot of Facebook, you know, posting consistently on social media, uh, Google my business, you know, just basically just trying to hit every avenue of marketing we could 
to start establishing, you know, our brand. And then that's, that, and then once we started establishing our brand, we started focusing on growing and, you know, really growing that brand and dominating like our market. But uh, when I started out, that's what I looked at too. I looked at the guys that were in our, in, like in our market, in our industry, like the big guys, there's like two or three really, you know, bigger companies that get majority of the business. And I saw what they were doing and also what they were doing not so well. You know, like they didn't have, they didn't have, they didn't have as much reviews on Google. So I'm like, I'm going to get more reviews than they are. You know, they weren't posting as much on social media. So I'm like, I'm going to post more than they are. And just started to slowly surpass those people. And now, I, you know, I'd like to confidently say I have surpassed those those guys. So, but like you said, a couple of them, uh, one of the guys, I mean, he had been in business since 07. And that's one thing I saw. I didn't see much any growth out of them, you know. But I think in this industry, people start making good money and they kind of get complacent too. You get to a certain point and you're like, oh, wow, okay, cool. I'm making X amount of dollars, you know, bills are paid, I'm okay. And then you just kind of coast and they don't, they don't stretch themselves to, to that next level. I mean, what, that's one of the topics that we talk about all the time is about, you know, what it really takes to get to that next level, right? Because once you get comfortable... I think there's a fear fact that gets into a lot of people's heads, right? It's like, man, you know, if I stretch this too much, am I going to break right. it? So whereas you, you just kept on going. Now, talk to us about the whole marketing thing, because I know that, that one of the big advantages that, you know, the roofing industry has is you can just basically go out, knock on doors, and you can take your product to the masses, right? You could just, as long as you have, you know, the a thick, thick enough skin to where the nose don't affect you and you can take a smile to the next door, um, you're okay. You can drum up some business pretty much anywhere, right? But let's talk about like more the the social media stuff that you were doing, the posting. Did you notice that that had a major impact in your business and the overall branding and how the community was responding to your business? Oh yeah, definitely, man. Because at the time, like I was one of the guys in our area that was on social media the most, you know, some of the other roofers would barely post once a week and I was posting every single day. But then also, and this is just like a nugget for a lot of industry leaders. It doesn't matter if it's restoration or roofing is there's so many Facebook groups, like for your communities. So like in our community, we have a Facebook group it's got like 30,000 people in it. And so someone will post, I'm looking for a roofer. And at first it would just be me going, hey, call us at here or roofing. But now we got customers that will post on that for us. And so like, you know, again, it was turning all, all those clients into like raving fans that are kind of like supporting your business and helping you sell. Like when you do a good job with a client, like they'll help you, they'll help, they'll sell your business for you, right? Um, but I mean, yeah, I would post every day. I'd get, you know, friends and family would share it. I'd make all my posts public. So whether, you know, if I was holding the camera and doing like a selfie video, just talking about the warrant, the roof we're putting on in the, you know, behind me and the, and the warranty the customer's getting, you know, I'd put that on, you know, whatever it is, I'd put on social media and I'd try to post at least once a day. And it's, it would just cause, it would just get traction, you know, cause you know, me alone, you know, I got 2000 friends on Facebook. And then if I can get 10 of my friends to like it and share it, you know, it's catching their audience as well. But I was Real big with the Facebook groups. The Facebook groups help me out a lot. Right. Are you doing any kind of like paid uh, ads when it comes down to social media, whether that's, you know, on Facebook or Instagram or, you know, any other channels? What outside of the door knocking yeah. aspect, like what what's the biggest channel that may, or maybe your favorite channel to advertise on? So before, you know, up until like I would say really up until like this past year, I used to just randomly boost posts. And I think I've talked to you about this too, and they weren't a lot. So now we've hired roofer marketers. These are SEO, and so they're doing Facebook and Instagram ads for us, and we're having a lot of success with those. Um, but our majority of our business, like if I ran an ad, if I ran like a sales report or a lead source report, the majority of our business is either door knocking, internet, or referrals. Internet and Facebook, so it could be like a Google ad or you know someone heard us on Facebook. But yeah, I mean. Social media and door knocking and referrals is the majority of our business. And of course, we do right. have a lot of other stuff. Like we know we're, we got a, we got two billboards now. We're on two radio stations. But when I look at different things, you, you look at it versus marketing versus branding. You know, you can't go on a radio station and expect to get 10 calls a day. But what you will right. expect is thousands of people to hear you. And then when then they see your sign and then they may call you, you know. Exactly. And that's a, like that, that's a very, very important distinction. Something that we talk about quite a bit is the different, there is a legitimate difference between branding and marketing. And these are two totally different channels. There's a lot of people that want to drum up more business and they're like, eh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and put an ad out on the radio. Not to say that if you have an ad out on the radio, you're not inherently going to get some calls. Yeah, you might. But that's really, for me, that falls more on the branding mm -hmm. side, exactly. right? staying front of mind. But if you're, let's say, 
say work in your neighborhood and you send out direct mailers or if you, you know, geo target that particular neighborhood with your Facebook ads and then your Google and then they go to your website and now they're pixeled. And now all of a sudden you start building this relationship, right, with that potential client. And then they hear you on the radio. You're like, man, okay, cool. It's like, you know, top of mind type of scenario, which is really important. But in the beginning, a lot of people, I think, try to go those quote unquote traditional routes and they don't see the ROI that they wanted to get. Whereas if you bolt on that kind of stuff after you already have a pretty good, decent campaign going on, that's where I think you see the, you know, that next bump in business. Exactly. I mean, what are your thoughts no, on that? I totally agree. And I always tell, I tell this to a lot of people is you have to market before you can brand. So you got to do the stuff like you're talking about. You have to door knock, post on social media, put a yard sign out of every job. We just started doing uh, automated direct mailers this year. Those are great sources, sending out mailers to neighborhoods you're working in. And then as like you start establishing business and then do the long-term branding st- style of, of things like putting a billboard up and, you know, being on the radio. Because, again, you know, that's that's just where you're keeping people in your mind. Like if you were like, again, talking about our lead source report, I think we've had four calls that were people called us this year directly off of the radio. But I have friends and family all the time that tell me, hey, we hear you guys on the radio. So I know like it's being heard, but I know it's not going to cause a direct call. But knocking on someone's door will get you direct business. You know, that's to me the fastest right. source to sell. The fastest way you can sell a roof, and I think in the roofing industry, is to knock on someone's door. And so that's such a huge advantage in you guys' business, oh, yeah. right? It's just being able to go out and just knock on the door and say, hey, by the way, I've got this. I can solve this issue for you. I mean, I've always been huge on being, if you have a product and or service, if you have the ability to go directly to the consumer and be like, hey, by the way, let me make you aware of this potential issue that you have and we can fix it. Like that's that's phenomenal. I mean, obviously, you know, in the, in the restoration side for us, water mitt, mold remediation, stuff like that. I mean, yeah, sure. You can try to <laughs> knock doors, but I mean, what are the odds? You guys got a pipe burst in there? What's going on? <laughs> you know, right? Right, yeah, exactly. exactly. It'd be you a know, little it's more like, challenging. It's not realistic. Yeah. Right. It, it's definitely a little bit more challenging. So talk to it, take us back, right? So when you first started your organization, um, how many people was it, you know, and then how did you scale from there? Like who were the first key players that you brought on to help you expand your business? Was this, you know, were these sales reps, door knockers? Like how did that pr- entire process? Yeah. Happen? So me and my father at first, um, so he ran like the operation side and I run, of course, the sales side. And like I said, I would door knock, sell a roof. He would sit on the job site all day. And of course he would, anybody who like drove by the job site or stopped by, he would get their information, pass it to me and I'd try to go close their jobs as well. You know, having a job site coordinator and roofing, a lot of companies don't, but having someone on a job site is extremely important because when the homeowner, when a customer or just a random person drives by or pulls up and stops, they're not going to try to talk to roofers on, on the roof. Like I have roofers that will definitely talk to, talk to people, but they're usually intimidated to talk to someone who's working. But if you got someone supervising out there, like then they can get their information and you can create more business. Right. So, you know, paying somebody 15 bucks an hour or $150 a day to be on your job is actually going to create more you know, a sale, it's not going to, it's not going to be an expense to you. A lot of people look at it like expense, like, oh, that waste of money having someone on the job. So I don't need anybody there to cruise around themselves. They do, but having a coordinator is important. But yeah, he'd be on the job site. And as we started to grow, uh, the first two people, we hired like pretty much two guys like the same month. His name's Stone. It's Stone and Austin. And uh, Austin, I think, is 21 now. Stone's 24, 25. I hired Stone from real, real estate to do sales for us. And I hired Austin to be a job site manager. So he would job site me. Uh, he would supervise me and uh, me and Stone's uh, jobs. And while he was on the jo- job, he would go and door knock, and because he really wanted to be in sales and he didn't have any sales experience, so he'd go and door knock on, on you know at the on build days and started selling stuff. And he slowly turned into a sales guy. So those two guys this past year were you know they both sold about one point two million dollars. Um, so they have grown tremendously over the past couple of years, of course. But yeah, they were our first two hires, and then we hired a office assistant, and then of course brought on a couple of other crews. We went from doing one roof a day to doing two roofs a day, and now we try to do three roofs a day. So talk to us about the selling process. Like when you first got into the roofing industry, did you already have uh, door-to-door sales experience, or was this a new thing that you kind of had to, to to tackle and to really get good? Yeah, at? I had never done door-to-door. I mean, most of my sales experience was restaurant industry. Um, so I was good with people, of course, but you know, with the restaurant industry, you're just trying to make sure someone's cheeseburger doesn't come out cold. Right. 
you know, I was handing them like $20 tickets instead of $10,000 tickets with a roof replacement. So yeah, I learned a lot just for like on YouTube, you know, just want, know, learning what, like what to say. Deshaun with Roof Hustlers, you know, he helped me a lot and invested in me. And, uh, and then he's invested into our company. He's been down here training our guys a couple of times now. But yeah, I would just kind of, I'd kind of wing my pitch at first. You know, I would always use, you know, whatever homeowner that I've already done some work for. I'd just try to use some kind of icebreaker or some reference, but I'd knock the door you know, go through like the whole pitch, you know, if they said no, I'll go on to the next house. Right. If they said yes, I'll right. do the inspection. And, and that's my thing. I told our sales guys this last Friday, I, some of you guys are so scared to get told no. You know, when I was single and I'd right. go to the, go out to the bar, I mean, I'd walk up to every girl and say, you want to dance? They tell me no, I go to the next one. I'll talk to 20 girls. One would tell me yes. I'm like, all right, cool. So take that same application and take it to this business. Right. But the better you get, you get less and less no's. Um, so it's very right. important, you know, I think it's a numbers game, but you also want to like improve, you actually improve yourself and actually know what to say at the door and have that mental fortitude, mental toughness. But so we'd perform the inspection. If it's an insurance claim, I'll come down, try to get them to sign a work authorization form and file the claim with them, meet their adjuster. And then from the time the roof gets approved, we're usually, since I've started business, we have always been about two weeks out of roof replacement. So no matter how busy we've gotten, that's why we try to bring on more crews. We've always stayed two weeks out. Homeowners always love that. We're not building a roof two months down the road. You know, they give me a right. deposit. They go on schedule. We'd complete it, close them out, give them their warranties, ask them for a review, uh, make sure they're extremely happy, and then try to move on to the next client. You know, it's all up for us. It's about turning and burning the customer, and but at the same time, like they're only in our, we try to have them in our process, our pipeline for as short as amount of time as possible. But why they're in that pipeline, trying to establish the best relationship we can with them. So five years down the road, they still know who we are. So what was, when you were doing selling and you know, you're new to the game and whatnot, what was the, the hardest objection for you to initially overcome? Like, was there one objection that you really struggled yeah, with? Yeah, the uh, there's a couple, but one of the big ones in our area, and now we don't really get any anymore because I think we've established, you know, a, a good brand about ourselves. But one of our biggest objections was, like, was not wanting to pay their – people not wanting to pay their deductible. And the only reason right. why, and I hope some of my, the people in our market hear this, is because there's, unfortunately, too many contractors in my area eating deductibles. So I would lose right. the roof to, you know, chuck in a truck that would eat their deductible and I just wouldn't do it. I'm like, I'm like, I'm not good. I'll right. straight tell them. I'm like, I'm, if I'm going to commit a felony, I'd rather rob a bank, uh, make more money, and rob a bank than lose money and not collect your thousand dollars. You know, <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, that's what you signed up for. I, I didn't tell you to pick your $5,000 deductible. So that was one of my <laughs> biggest objections. Of course, in, you know, where we're at, one of our biggest markets is Peachtree City. A lot of people in Peachtree City uh, work for the airlines. So wanting to talk to the spouse and then, you know, like, oh, I need to talk to my husband. And then, of course, then trying to get that follow up and never being able to get that follow up. So now. And how did you like overcome those objections? Like what, how, I mean, obviously that was in the beginning. Now, typically when you're having these same objections, you're coming from, you know, from a totally different place and you've got a lot more confidence. You've got a lot more wins under your belt. And I'm sure you figured out, Hey, this works, this doesn't work. So like, what's, what, what are some of those rebuttals look like? Yeah. So with a deductible, it was really about just informing the customer and providing the value to them. So, Hey, this is why you pay your deductible. But at the same time, this is what we're doing to your home. A lot of what we provide like an architectural upgrade for free. So a lot of times we're replacing three tabs. So like, yeah, you're paying a thousand dollar deductible, but I'm putting you know, more than a thousand dollars of value back into your house, you know, so I would explain that kind of things to the homeowner that usually would click a lot more. We, and so when I started kind of providing more of a value, tell them it's an investment, not just an expense, you know, you never want to use the word cost expense, you know, your price, you always want to use value and investment. So when I started using, started explaining to the homeowner, it's more of a value and an investment, I started having a higher closing ratio with the deductibles with, uh, would people want to talk to their spouse? I would try to set another appointment. So I was like, oh, I really got to talk to my husband. I'd be like, oh, what time is he going to be home? Call him right now. What time will he be home? Or what time, what days is he off? Oh, he's usually off on Saturdays. Okay, great. I'll, I'll be back by Saturday at 10, 10 a.m. And what's your phone number? Right. So that's one thing. I used to always ask for the info. Like I wouldn't, I would try to ask for the sale. Now you assume the sale, right? So instead of, right. instead of saying, can I have your phone or can I have your first name? I would just have my iPad and go, okay, great. What's your first name? Mr. Stan or whatever it is. And that's, I would just take that information uh, and kind of pretty much assume the sale and be confident. 
And this is, this is like the biggest thing when it comes to selling. I think anything, right? Regardless of what industry you're in, the, the same rules always apply. It's you're assuming the sale. You're assuming that, you know, the, the individual is going to give you the information that it is that you're asking for. Um, and, and that just makes all the difference in the world, right? Now, when it comes down to your guys, right? And they're looking that there's, you said that earlier today that they're scared sometimes to, you know, get that initial objection. I'm of the opinion that the sale re- really doesn't start until you get that first no. Like that's when the sale starts. Everything prior to that was, you know, foreplay. Now is when you're actually down to getting that sale made. In your training, like what does that process usually look like to to get people comfortable with getting to that initial no, getting to that first objection? Yeah, so we always, we never want to ask closing questions. So we don't want to ask, you know, can I perform inspection? Is yes or no, right? Right. We try to gear our guys to ask open-end questions. Like, when was the last time your roof's been, you know, someone's came out and looked at your roof? I'm not sure it's been a couple of years. Well, we recommend, you know, you get your roof inspected, you know, at least six months to once a year. You know, I'm here right now. I got my ladder. Uh, it would be about 15 minutes. I'll be right back. You know, so, again, assuming a, a sale and not asking closing questions. And kind of if someone does say no, now, uh, and we've learned this from Deshaun when he came last year, like he doesn't, I don't know if you, I think you've talked to him, he does not mind like combating with a homeowner. Like he's not rude right. and he's not aggressive, but he does not mind like negotiating back and forth. If they tell him no, he's like, do you mind me asking you why? And see what their answer is. You know, you want to really find out like, like what are, what is, what's that homeowner's turn off? Like why, why don't they want you at the door? They don't know you, they don't trust, you know, they may say no, I got to do some research. Again, you know, at that point, you know, let's establish a level of trust and say, okay, well, I really do think you need a roof, your roof inspector. I can see a shingle missing from here. You know, I understand you don't know me. So here, here's my information. Let me get your phone number. I'll be back by tomorrow. In the meantime, get on Google and check us out because we got more reviews than anybody else around here. You know, so it's just kind of learning to kind of negotiate with that homeowner. And again, not exactly just take no and walk away, but they do say no. Let's find out why they're telling us no. Because even if you don't get that sale, it's going to perform, it's going to make you better for the next customer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then also like one of the mental tricks that I always like to use is to associate a value with every single right. no, right? So even if you were to go ahead and take your top producer and you say, okay, cool. Well, they generated X amount of top line revenue and their commissions for the year were X amount, right? How many doors did they knock? How many times did they get a no? How many times out of those, you know, doors that they knocked, did they actually close a sale? And you can break it down pretty, pretty damn accurately to where you actually have a formula. And what that does is it totally changes the overall mindset of getting to that next door because you know, it's a lot different getting a no and be like, oh, I got nothing out of this thing. Whereas you got to know and you can put $150 value to it, let's say. Like that, that changes the entire game because that no is just a stepping stone to get you to that next, you know, prospect that ends up saying yes. And what I've noticed, especially when you're, when, when you put it in perspective like that for a lot of salespeople are like, oh, yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right. And it just t- changes the overall energy in which they approach that next door. You know, something I told the guys is you don't really ever know what, what happens when a homeowner closes the door. So they may tell you no, and because this has happened to me. I've had a homeowner, like, they took my card, but they told me, because that's the thing. You always, no matter what, want to leave them with some information. You don't want to give them information while you're talking because they're just going to read the information and not listen to you. But you want to give them information before you, before you leave. So I've had homeowners tell me no, shut the door. Four months go by, and they call me going, hey, I need a roofer. I don't know if you remember me. You knocked on my door four months ago, and I'm like, heck, yeah. You know, so always, you know, <laughs> always say you reap what you sow in the seeds you plant today, you harvest tomorrow. So that's the thing that I tell the guys, like they get discouraged. They may go out all day and not get, and they may not get a direct lead that day, but you do that for a month straight. Like you're going to have people rolling in and calling, you know, and it, cause that information may be sitting on the counter or on their fridge for, for months to come. And, and they're going to remember next time, you know, when they told you no, they they think everything's fine, even though there is a shingle missing, they don't care. And the next rainstorm, a stain pops up on their ceiling and they call you. Or they just kind of get that yeah. seed planted in their mind. Where they're like, man, is my roof okay? Can I actually get a roof? Like maybe that I should have gets, just come back. That spouse and gets home and, you know, she's like, this guy stopped by today. And I, I told him to leave. And he's like, well, wait, did, like, let's, let's look into this. And then, and then they, they have that conversation and then they end up, you know, maybe this other spouse calls you or vice versa. So, yeah, I mean, that's, it's always critical to leave them with information because again once that door shuts you don't know how they're what's going through their mind 
Yeah, exactly. So what's the, do you have a follow-up process in place for the clients that are the prospects that you call on and they're like, Hey, you know, not today, you know, and then obviously inevitably like a lot of those clients or prospects end up falling through the cracks, right? And most people don't have a follow-up process for that. Do you have anything set in place for your company to kind of make sure that, Hey, you already knocked on that door once, right? You invested some time and energy and odds are that there's probably an issue with that roof anyways. So there, there's definitely money there. The question is who's going to go ahead and get that sale. So do you have anything in place as far as like follow up and trying to, you know, garner more business from uh, the people that you touch? Yes, definitely. So and, and I encourage every business owner this. It doesn't matter if you do restoration, roofing, gutter, siding, whatever your business is, I think you should write out your whole process of your company from the cut, you know, we, and that's what we did. We took like what would a perfect client look like in our business and we wrote out every single step of the process from the day they, the day they call in or we knock on their door till the day they're closed out. And so uh, I hired an office assistant this year, but after meeting a couple of the guys from Monarch, I changed that position to inside sales. So what she does is, you know, she definitely takes all the incoming calls, but she also makes outgoing calls. So any prospect, so if one of our reps goes to a homeowner's house, provides, you know, goes through the presentation and provides them with an estimate for roof replacement, they don't sign up that day. The next day, our office or our inside sales will call and just check in and say, hey, Miss, Mrs. Smith, you know, JC is one of our guys was at your home yesterday. Uh, he provided you with a roof replacement estimate. Just want to know uh, what you guys thought about it, if you're all ready to move forward and get on schedule. And that way we can get that feedback. So we always do call and follow up. If they tell us, oh, we're getting some other quotes, we'll go, okay, great. And we're going we're to schedule an appointment for like next week to follow up next Monday. If they say the price was too high, you know, he may have quoted a 50-year golden pledge warranty, right? Well, great. Well, we got some other some other value options. So that, that way too, like, because we used to not have a good follow-up process and we had prospects that were sitting in our pipeline for like two months, you know, and, and it wasn't with every rep, you know, we got 10 guys, but you know, a couple reps would have, you know, prospects sitting in that pipeline for way too long. And so we want our, we want, our thing is every prospect needs, every file needs to be opened and touched at least once a week and updated. Right. And that way we can either approve them or we can, you know, mark them dead, you know, move on. Cause that's the thing. We just want to know if the person legitimately wants to do business with us. If right. they don't like for me, when I got 290 prospects, like if I can either move some to approve or mark them dead, like it, like it's a wet off your back. It makes you feel better and it makes you a little more organized and you can focus on the, on the real clients on hand. Um, but yeah, we'd follow up pretty much next day and then follow up again, you know, the next week. That's awesome. And on that note, let's just take a quick break to thank our sponsors. Photo documentation is possibly one of the most important aspects of what it is that we do in the restoration business. Not only so that the client knows exactly what's going on, but also so that you can prove your work to insurance companies. One of the best ways that I found to go ahead and document our projects is by using Company Cam. Company Cam is an amazing app. It has so many features, everything from time stamped and GPS located photos, uh, individual project files, unlimited photo storage, in-app communication with your crew, a live stream of all of your projects as the photos are coming in, as if it was an Instagram feed. So from a managerial standpoint, Company Cam can help you there as well. But more importantly, it gives you the ability to protect your organization while documenting and keeping everything nice and neat. So we've got a really special offer for you. If you go to companycam.com, forward slash dominate. Not only will you get your 14 day free trial, but you're also going to get the first two months, 50% off. So again, head on over to companycam.com forward slash dominate, get the app and I'm sure you're going to love it. All right. So we're back. Um, let's go ahead and, and take a little bit of a deeper dive now. We've talked a, lot, a little bit about sales, but let's dive into the, the, the marketing aspect. Cause I think the marketing aspect is just so damn important. And I think that it's being so overlooked by so many companies and you guys on the roofing side, right? Like I think that you guys are doing this a lot more, right? Like you guys are actually much more active when it comes down to, you know, doing direct mail and, uh, you know, uh, Facebook and, uh, uh, Google and all of these other mediums for the water mitt mold remediation guys. If you look at our industry as a general whole, we're really not that aggressive. Um, and I think that part of it is because a lot of the people in, in the industry do 
program work and that's kind of a story in and of itself right but when you have to go out and you have to hunt you know the 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 the, the business uh marketing is you know it's the the key it's the one thing that can definitely move the needle so you know looking at your business now um and we talked a little bit about this but i'd like to take a, a deeper dive um when you're doing Google ads, right, or you're doing uh, direct mail, let, let's talk about those processes first. Um, direct mail, every single time that you hit a neighborhood, are you doing direct mail it, to those neighborhoods to stay front of mind? Or are you doing direct mail first in a neighborhood that you want to attack, let's say, a week or two weeks from now? So every now and then, if a storm hits a certain area or we know that neighborhood's getting older, we will blast some mailers out. But usually when we blast mailers at like one time, we don't get a lot of traction. What I've started learning right. like with using dope marketing is uh, we got it automated now. So if we get a roof, a roof replacement signed up in a neighborhood, we will send out mailers saying, hey, you know, mailers will go out before the roof schedule and say, we, we will be working in your neighborhood. It may have a picture of that house that we're going to be doing, you know, and we'll have all information on it. And then once a job is built, we'll send out mailers again to the same neighborhood saying we just finished the roof in your neighborhood. And that way we could maybe put a finished photo on that mailer of that roof. So now we've hit them twice. And again, this the day of the build, hopefully, you know, we got one of our guys knocking on the door. So this time they've seen, you know, they drove by the actual job site. They've seen our yard sign, our trucks, our flag. They may have seen our billboard on the highway. They may have heard us on the radio. And then they got their mailer at their mailbox and we knock on the door. And so it's a lot easier to, you know, that's one thing I would say. It's a lot easier for us to close door knocks because of how much marketing and branding we are doing. And more importantly, man, like the guy just knows his stuff, right? And one of the things that I, I firmly believe is going to happen, right? We call that kind of marketing, like old school marketing, right? Because it's direct and it's mail and everybody's thinking about digital. I think there's going to be a point in time to, in the near future where that's going to become the new school way of marketing, yeah, right? Because back the digital landscape is going to be just so saturated where so many business owners finally come to the realization oh, I need to have a good Google My Business presence. I need to have Google ads. I need to have Facebook. I need to have Facebook ads, right? I need to have all of this stuff that they're totally neglecting the power of the direct mail pieces, right? And the handwritten notes. Have you done any of the uh, handwritten notes? We haven't notes? done any of those uh, yet. We were going to do them for Christmas and I was traveling a good bit. And uh, But those are super, super cool. He's got like a machine, like he writes it for you. It's yeah. really neat. And I would yeah. say one thing I forgot too is He's actually going to be given like the information in neighborhoods, like dope markings, and give the information from those neighborhoods over to our uh, roofer marketers, our SEO guy, and so they're going to be sending out Facebook ads to those neighborhoods off off of the same information of the direct mailer. So that homeowner is also getting a, right. like they're we're going to be on their Facebook feed too. Um, so they should see Hero like a couple of times, at least you know I would say at least twice before we even knock on their door, you know. Right, um, if, and then if, again, if we don't, if we do miss that door, and we don't knock on it. At least they have gotten our information a couple of different times. Exactly. So that's on the, on the uh, you know the direct mailing side. Uh, Facebook is one of those things where a lot of some people either love it or they hate it. Right? There's there's really not a whole lot of in between. And the people that hate it, obviously, it's because they they haven't really been able to trace back a direct ROI, right? Saying, hey, you know, I'm spending X amount of dollars a month on Facebook and Instagram, and you know, I'm not I'm not making my profit back. So, what are you guys seeing on that front, and what's been working well, and what do you recommend for like other roofing companies or even mitigation companies, right, on how to properly you know, implement Facebook as part of their campaign. So strategy. I will say one thing that our SEO guy is doing with our Facebook ads that he's doing, it has a link. So they're clicking the link and it's taking them to fill out, you know, pretty much a, an inspection thing where they, we, you know, the lead, I guess a lead form is what they're filling out. But right. whenever a customer calls in, you know, one big thing that, you know, our office asks is how'd you hear about us? And that they're going to say Facebook, but they're not going to tell you if it came from a Facebook ad or a friend or they're just going to say the word Facebook. So that's why we just know to invest into Facebook as a whole, you know, whether it's an ad or it's our, po our own post or if it's, you know, friends and family sharing our, share, sharing our social media or whatever it is. But because you're, it's the same thing with Google, you know, when you call in, they're going to say, oh, I heard about you from the Internet. How annoying yeah. can you be to that customer? OK, great. What search engine did you click? Did you click Google? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, where'd you click? Right. You know, so we just try to get that general information and know that, like, we do get traction from Google or we do get traction from Bing. We are getting traction from Facebook, but uh, they do have direct links on, on our ads. So we do know if they fill it out from that direct link that it did come from that ad. So that's really cool. 
Um, one of the things, and I think that this is an issue that a lot of business owners have, right? So they've got all of these different channels that you're marketing on, and it's very, very difficult to actually trace back where that deal came from. So for example, you know, maybe, you know, they can say when you're office rep picks up the phone and says, Hey, by the way, what did you hear about us? They say Facebook. Yeah. But two weeks prior to that, what really captured their attention was the flyer. Yeah, exactly. And they're actually doing that. So one of the things that, uh, you know, I I recommend highly is like tracking numbers for any and all pieces of, of your, of your, of your business. And I, I mean, to me, that just seems it's, it's a lot more to handle, right? Because you've got, let's say your company wrap, you know, on all your vehicles, like that's like your main number, right? And you've got your, the number that you put on Facebook, the number that you put on Google ads, like all of a sudden now, next thing you know, you've got like 10 phone numbers that you're managing, but for a lot of people that that works really well. Have you noticed that like when you're implementing your tracking numbers, that that kind of helps you hone in on where to spend your marketing dollars? Yes. And I used to be against tracking numbers because I'm all about branding. So like our phone number is 833-321-HERO. Like even our phone number is branded. And so, like, you know, uh, again, Jim was the one that had to really get me to do tracking numbers. And now I'm kind of starting to see why. And I definitely believe in, like, you, to have tracking numbers. That way you know that money is getting used wisely. Because so a couple of our ads, like, uh, we even have, like, a different one, a different Google My Business that's got a tracking number on it. So that way, again, but, yeah, I used to be against them. And now I'm definitely a fan of them. But I mean, because yeah. um, once you get into yeah. it, right, because again, it's, it's all about the data, right? Like if you spend a thousand dollars on one area of marketing and you don't really know if it's working, like most people just shut it off. And you know what, if you would have had a tracking number or you would have had some metric that you could actually, you know, measure, then you would have been like, oh, wow, this is actually working. Let's go ahead and stick with this medium. But because there's a lot of business owners don't have a smart way to track it, all of their numbers, all, all of the marketing campaigns are going to one phone number. And again, like you're, you're relying on the prospect to tell you, Hey, yeah, I went on to Google and then from Google, I skipped all the ads. And then I, you know, I, I didn't click on the, you know, Google map section. I skipped that. And then I found you organically. Like nobody's going right. to tell you that. Right. Whereas if you've got like data that you can track, I think that that, that helps quite a bit. What other um, mediums of, of advertising is it that, you know, you're really enjoying right now or what do you think moving forward is going to be the future of advertising and getting your message out there to the consumer it's a good question i would i would say we try to hit every single avenue we can so if there's another form of marketing we definitely want to add it in but you know and that's one thing i've learned like you look at some companies whether it's you know roofing or restoration they're usually really good at just one aspect of biz of marketing and and, and then they like don't do it like i met a guy when we were in, at that door-to-door con in utah He's like, yeah, our guys, we door knock. I don't have a Google page or nothing. I'm just like, well, you're missing out on millions of dollars, I think. You know what I mean? So, you know, even though, like, we've created a big enough brand where people will still call our office and keep our office busy, and we could probably still run, like, six reps, you know, and do really good numbers, we still door knock. You know, we still put yard signs out. I'll, get, I'll do, like, a yard sign campaign. when Like, whenever there's, like, we had the, you know, the, I guess the big, the last big election in our county, like, I got signs that said, vote yes. It's all, and it just had our Hero Roofing logo. And I put like 100 of those out around town. Dude, I got so many right. calls off those. People are calling me going, what do I vote for? And I'm like, nothing, just say if you need a roof. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, you know, we put those out, put a tracking number on them, put those all over town. You know, so we hit every aspect we can, whether it's, you know, you know logo trucks or, you know, our office. I look at our office as a big billboard. You know, having office space, I think, nowadays is, is very, can be very key. Uh, you know, I know a business, a roofing company owner, he runs out of his, out of his home and he tells homeowners that saves saves them you know money because he doesn't have as much overhead you know you know my office is three thousand dollars a month but it gets like forty thousand cars passed in a day but yeah i mean we do the direct mailers facebook google we got a bing page now um because we 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 have learned a lot some people don't like using google right so we we got we got a bing we even started DuckDuckGo because we've got like three callers this year off of DuckDuckGo. just right you're gonna know though but if you get someone from DuckDuckGo, they're gonna be a little bit uh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Right, right, yeah, right. They may, yeah, they may not even want to give you their email. Yeah, they may be a little sketchy. So, um, yeah, but that's, you know, it's important, right? Just having all of these different mediums, right? Like everybody's talking always about Google. Like Google, and again, it is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. But that being said, there's tons of 
you know, particularly like older people, right? Where they'll just go, their computer, you know, takes a dump. They go to Best Buy or whatever it is that they buy their computers at. They buy, you know, a regular laptop and they just bring it home. They power it up and that's it. They're not downloading, you know, Chrome. They're not doing any of that stuff. That means that they're going and using Bing as their main search engine. engine. And now you're not using Bing. So, which is, you know, something funny that a lot of companies for some reason they don't do. There's actually... Like you could take your Google ads campaign and import that exact same campaign into Bing, right? So what, but the problem is, or the issue is that it's a fraction of the cost of what Google yeah, it's a lot cheaper. is running. So much cheaper, ridiculously cheaper. So, but what that does is you're basically dollar cost averaging down, right? So let's say, for example, you're only spending, let's say a thousand dollars on Google to get X amount of clicks. Well, now you're going to add Bing. And it's the exact same campaign. You're going to get the same amount of clicks on Bing. So now you've got 2000 clicks, but these are like $2 a click. And then on Google, they're like at $5 a click. So overall, when you look at how much money you invested and how much, you know, how many clicks you actually got, all of a sudden now you're out of pocket per click overall is a lot cheaper. So there's a huge advantage to, to using Bing. And there's just, again, there's just a certain... Uh, you know, demographic that's only going to use Bing, just like a certain, uh, you know, part of the population is only going to use home advisor to find their, find their roofer, right? Like, so you just got to be wherever it is that your potential client is at, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many people are on those other search engines. And again, like you're not being able to, if you're on all those different search engines and you're doing every source of marketing, you're going to hit more of your of your market, more of your community, you know, because if you're only door knocking again, you're only hitting a certain aspect of, of, of homeowners. If you're only on, you know, Google, you're only hitting a certain aspect of homeowners. If I, if I only had a billboard on the highway, I'm only hitting people that are going to work to Atlanta. I'm on two radio stations now. I'm on one's the Joy FM, it's a Christian station, and one's a country, and I'm on the other one's a country station. So I used to only be on the country station, and it's pretty, and it's really cheap. It's like 600 bucks a month. So I was like, right. I, you know, I'll do that. The other one's like 1600 but again, I'm, you get two different, you know, you're, you're getting different clientele from, from, from both, both of them. So it's, when it comes to marketing and branding, I just think to have a really, a business that's going to grow quickly, you got to do everything, you know, you, you, right. Is there a percentage that you would like recommend of revenue to organizations that, you know, are just starting off or maybe they haven't really looked at marketing and said, hey, this is super, super important for my business. Is there a percentage of revenue that you would recommend going straight to some kind of marketing? I say when you, uh, if you Google how much revenue you're supposed to, or how much revenue you're supposed to spend on marketing, it tells you 5%. Our company as a whole, we spend about 2% on marketing and branding as a whole. So I think now we're spending close to like $20,000 a month, um, which is nuts because few years ago i barely made twenty thousand dollars a year so <laughs> <laughs> it's insane right. it's a blessing but yeah i would try i would try to say starting out like two percent and then if you start doing more and more you know because you want to establish a good brand and you want to and you want to door knock and stuff too so there's some stuff you're going to do you like you're not going to really think of as advertising or you're not going to think of as branding right and if you if you if you do something with a local school you know that's me more towards branding than the other one but as a total yeah like i said we spend like two percent and we and we had really good good rates with that. You know, we have it. I will say, we have a good name. You know, Hero Roofing is easy to market and get business. And I've said this since day one. Like, if if a homeowner is, you know, she's got two two pamphlets out in front of her, and one's Chuck's roofing, and the other one's Hero Roofing, just off of the name, like which one's she more likely to call? And that, but that right. doesn't mean you can't have like a normal name and not have a really strong brand. You know, a brand is how people perceive you. You know, it's like, it's how right. they look at your business and what they think of your business. And so like when we wanted people to look at our business, we wanted them to think like we're heroes in our community. We're helping them day in and day out. And that's what we, we push on all of our reps and all of our employees, our office manager. It doesn't matter if it's from eight to five, once at five o'clock and you leave, like, if you still got hero gear on, like you should still act like a hero. So on, you know, if you got old lady walking behind you in the store, open that door for her because again, that's and it, it, when you think about it, that's branding right there. Like opening the door for doing right. a gesture for somebody, you know, is doing something nice. I mean, even if your roofing company is called Smith's Roofing or Smith's Restoration, like how do you want people in your community to see you? You know, and that's what you need to right. kind of gear your business towards, and that's what's going to make money is gearing towards your business how you want to be perceived. That's awesome. So talk about what's going on next for your organization. Like, where do you guys see Hero in the next, you know, five years? And what are you doing to kind of get there? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, my biggest, I'm very goal oriented, right? So at first, you know, like when I first started business, our goal was to do a million and double, double, double. So our, you know, and then our, our goal was to dominate our market. And if you ask our supply chain, that's, you know, we're, we're the biggest purchaser in our, or our supplier in the area. So we have worked really hard to dominate our market right here in South, South Metro. So over the next five years, I want to be the biggest roofing company in the state of Georgia. You know, I, I, I look at people like Apple and Monarch and those big companies and like, like I just, like I got goals and dreams to kind of grow my brand that way. I think if you're a roofing company owner, it kind of goes back to what you were saying in the beginning, like the fear of success. I also feel like you're kind of being selfish when you don't grow your brand because with me, like if I'm able right. to grow, it's not really about the revenue for me. It's about being able to give back to other people and help other guys. Like I got, you know, talking about Austin again, Austin came from working, he was in the Marine Reserves and working at Lowe's and this past year he made $108,000. You know, I got a production manager that worked at Lowe's for years and, and again, able to provide him a, a something that he loves to do. You know, so I think if you if you have something great and you don't grow it, you're selfish. You know, so that's my goal is like, I right. know we have something great here, so I wanna grow it and expand it. And I want the hero name to be pretty big and not in long term, not really just in roofing. We look, we're looking into eventually getting into doing solar and then possibly maybe even having like a restoration side one, you know, down the road as well. That's awesome, dude. So if anybody wants to go ahead and uh, get in contact with you, check out your company and um, where would they find you on social media? Like what are your best social media platforms to, you know, have people reach out yeah, to you? So my personal uh, Instagram is the CEO hero. And then our business Instagram is your roof hero. Our Facebook is uh, I think facebook.com slash your roof hero. You can add me on Facebook at Nick Roof Hero Brandon. Um, again, talk about branding. The brand is, you know, I got it in my name as well. So people know exactly what I do when they add me on Facebook. I just started LinkedIn. I'm really, man, I like LinkedIn, dude. I, I, if you're a business owner and you want to get in the commercial aspect and stuff, I think being on LinkedIn is like super important. Um, I, I joined LinkedIn like last week, so I'm on there as well. Um, but yeah, Facebook, Instagram, everything. If you type in Hero Roofing, you should, all of our stuff should pull up. Awesome. And by the way, for those of you listening, all of the links uh, to go ahead and reach out is going to be in the show notes uh, below or in the video description below. So besides that, man, look, thank you so much for taking the time and, uh, you know, walking us through your overall journey and your business. I'd love to see what, you know, Hero does over the course of the next several years. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. And uh, outside of that, we got to go ahead and do this again. Yeah. Like, I, I think we should go ahead and put this on the calendar for, you know, we should do this like 12 and 24 months and see like where you are now. And then just that overall growth. I think that'll that'd be, be cool. fun. That'd be awesome. Awesome, man. Well, let's go ahead. Restoration Nation, make sure that you hit up your boy, Nick, show some support, show some love uh, at Hero. And um, yeah, on the next one, make sure that you tune in. And hey, by the way, for everybody watching and listening, if you're getting some value from the uh, podcast, make sure that you go ahead and rate and subscribe uh, if you haven't done so already. And make sure on the podcast itself, uh, if you're listening, uh, you know, whether that's on Spotify or on Apple, that you actually go ahead and drop like a quick little little one-line comment. It totally helps uh, break the algorithm and it will mean the world to us. And on the next one, let's go. You've been listening to Restoration Domination, interviewing the restoration business's top industry insiders, the movers and shakers, the hustlers and hackers. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on Instagram. Find Rico at Rico Garcia Jr. And check out the YouTube channel at Restoration Domination. Till next time, this is Restoration Domination. Hustle. Hack. Dominate.